Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here for the Cancer Education Series. I'm Dick Deming. I'm Medical Director of Mercy One Cancer Center and founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. The Cancer Education Series is supported financially from a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. And you're in for a treat tonight, and I'm in for a treat. We have a father-son duo here tonight. So we have Stephen Dana and his father, Rob. Uh, Rob uh, grew up in New Jersey, he's lived in uh, Iowa since 2008, and Rob is senior vice president at ITA Group. And uh, Stephen is now a freshman at the University of Iowa. Go Hawks! And um, as Stephen has a, a, has a, a journey through cancer that we're going to talk about, um, uh, and we're going to talk about, um, you know, these unexpected things that just fall out of the sky, like a, like a mountain to climb without, without expectation. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk a bit about what we call AYA. So AYA in, uh, the cancer world stands for adolescent and young adult. And one of the reasons we're going to focus on Stephen's story is the cancer journey is different for everyone, but there are some particular, um, nuances and, and special concerns for young individuals and their family when you go through a cancer journey. So, uh, welcome. Stephen. Thank you. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So, uh, we, we are, uh, live tonight, uh, on the eve of March madness. So, uh, we've got the Hawkeyes playing tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, so tell, what's it like to be a Hawkeye right now? It's awesome. It's the best. Two of the best players in the country with Caitlin and Keegan. And it's just awesome going to the games every single week. And I'm super excited to watch tomorrow. So do you, uh, did you get to go to all of the home games? or I would think I only missed two of the men's games. And I got to go to a couple of women's games at the end of the season. So I'm super glad I got to watch them. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's start with the beginning of your story. So uh, you're... Um, sophomore at Waukee High School. Mm -hmm. And what was the first symptom you had yeah. that, that you thought something yeah. was going on? So sophomore year, spring break, I was playing tennis. I've been a tennis player my whole life. And I started having a bump on my knee with a little bit of pain, but we didn't think anything of it because I'm playing tennis through the season. We we're like, oh, it's just torn muscle, like tendonitis, something like that. Kept getting worse. We kept playing on it. I'm a teenager. I don't want to tell my parents or tell my coach because they'll say you can't play anymore. So I keep going. And then I start losing sleep over it. I start having to use crutches to walk. And that's when we finally go to a physical therapist who recommends us to a sports scientist. And that's when it all really fell down on me. Okay. So uh, probably confirmation was an x-ray. Yeah, well, so I had, I was originally an ultrasound when I couldn't oh, stand the ultrasound. Okay. I went to go get an x-ray and an MRI. That's the next day. Gotcha. So the first test was an ultrasound, but it, it was so tender mm -hmm. that even putting the ultrasound yeah. probe. And that was my, that was the third ultrasound I had. The first two I was fine with, but then the third one, I couldn't even mm -hmm. stand it. So that's when they knew that there was something wrong with it. So uh, what was the date of that first x-ray? It was early June. I know the day I found June out. June of? 2019. 2019. And then I found out that I had, was diagnosed with an osteosarcoma on June 14th. Okay. So what, what, what was going through your mind when you were told you had an osteosarcoma? It was pretty crazy. I was, my parents told me we were sitting on the back deck. I still remember it like it was yesterday. I don't even like, there was so much going through my head. I ended gotcha. up leaving that night and going out with some buddies and just hanging out trying to take my mind off of it. So mom and dad told you. Yeah, you we had a, we we had a the doctor before earlier in the day kind of like led up to it but didn't necessarily say it and then they told me later that night gotcha so rob you got the call from dr miller or from, from not from the x-ray the, the biopsy certainly the was biopsy. another okay. moment of okay. all of that rehearsed uh, the x-ray call came in from uh, the x-ray technician basically and just let us know right there in that night oh, okay. um so yeah i i happened to be at work and uh, I was getting a play by play basically at work. And you can imagine your head is just split between work and home. And, uh, you know, I'm watching my phone. I'm, I'm listening, you know, play by play. And then as soon as that came down, I rushed right home. You know, and I was probably home around two o'clock that afternoon. And we were on the deck at 2.30 with Stephen. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I think, yeah, I think my first words were our lives are about to change. And I said ours because mm -hmm. um, we were all in it together. So at the point that you, you, you knew the diagnosis, you probably hadn't had much consultation about what the path was going to be. Not at all. Zero. Yeah. Zero path. So, so as you're trying to tell your son that he has cancer, did you use the word cancer? Yeah. That yeah. He said, time. you have cancer. Oh, yeah. And then they explained okay. it more than that. But yeah, they yeah. didn't, they didn't uh -huh. sugarcoat it at all. They just okay. told me, which I'm glad about. I didn't want mm -hmm. it to be sugarcoated or hidden from me at mm -hmm. all. I just wanted to face it straight on. Mm -hmm. So what was going through your mind as you were uh, formulating how you were going to tell Stephen? Hmm. You know, I think, uh, Stephen said, there was no, no punches pulled, you know, the reality we were all going to face together. I wanted to make sure that Stephen knew that uh, we were there, period, and that come what may, we were there. And that's kind of the hard part because we didn't know the path. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to explain mm -hmm. to your 17-year-old, you know, what the path is going to be because we want to know it as bad as he does. Mm -hmm. But he's, you know, he needs to know. Um, so it was kind of just a, uh, we set a foundation right then and there that, uh you know, we're all going to have a role to play in this. Come what may, we're all going to have each other's back. I could tell actually Stephen was more concerned about his mom and dad um, than we were of him. <laughs> were, you, were you in tears? Oh, of course. Of course. All three of us at some point, for sure, um, were in tears. But it wasn't because of fear. It was because I think Stephen was worried about us. We were worried about Stephen. We're worried. Stephen and I are worried about mom. <laughs> Um, just because of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And I will say all those tears dried up, the more information we got. Mm -hmm. Information, is, as I'm sure you're going to get to, is the key in all of this uh, to your comfort in that journey. Well, let's go to the first slide because um, we got some pi uh, pictures here and everyone can see what that first x-ray looks like. Did When did you get to see the x-ray for the first time? Well, we saw it the day I got it, right when and I got it. And next one, George, I think. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Okay. So there's when I got my port placed on the day of my biopsy. That was kind of, we knew if I woke up, or I knew if I woke up with a port that it was cancerous. And then on the right is the knee replacement I ended up getting when they took out my knee and part of my tibia. So, but yeah, I woke up with a port and that's, I think that's really when I knew that it was real and that. That was that was really gotcha. So biopsy and port. Same. You had the X-ray, and the X-ray findings are pretty um, specific. But obviously, a piece of the tissue yeah. when they look at it in a microscope is really the, um, uh, the the essence of the, making the diagnosis. So that happened, uh, and you see, and you knew that if it were mm -hmm. if the biopsy confirmed it was positive, they're going to put the port in yeah. during the same anesthesia. Yeah. And you woke up and go, okay. Yeah, I knew it was real. It was, it, was, it was probably the weirdest feeling I've ever felt. Let's go back to the, the, the beginning because um, we got some great pictures that sort of uh, set up uh, prior to. So here we are. This is before the diagnosis. Well, right? next one, I would say. Next slide, George, if you don't mind. Um, you can see like Stephen and I were in Park City, Utah, skiing there, skiing on the tumor, the inflamed tumor at that time, having no idea, mm -hmm. having the best time of our lives, not mm -hmm. knowing what was lurking. This is what March, yeah, and you, you know, we so spring April, break, yeah. yeah, sophomore year, mm -hmm. and uh, right before school. everything, yep. So it was the same thing. I was playing tennis on. We just didn't even know it yet. Riding bikes together, you know, we're huge mountain bikers, huge snowboarders, um, just normal life. And then it all just like what, what? And then you start thinking about how everything's going to change from there. Um, but then That's you can see the friends stepping up. It was. Let's go to the next slide, George. So, um, so think, uh, tell me again, what was going through your mind when you came out of anesthesia? I mean, well, like I said, going into it, I knew if I woke up with that port that our suspicions were confirmed and that it really was cancer. And when I woke up, I saw the port, I knew that it was real. I knew that though well, we had been told that then treatment would start in the next few days and it did, it was moving so fast. So then I only really had a few more days of like, a norm, normal ish life before I was back in the hospital again. So um, you got uh, chemotherapy first, mm -hmm. correct? You had, had the biopsy. So I had the biopsy, then I had 10 treatments of chemo over three months before my knee surgery. 
And then I had a couple more months after. So the chemotherapy, were you going to the university for the chemo? I was at blank children's hospital. Okay. So chemo. you're getting the chemo mm -hmm. here yeah. and how frequent was the chemotherapy? So I would have it in three week cycles. I'd have two weeks of a certain kind and then one week of a really strong kind. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. And then I'd have a week off. So it's like three week cycles. And I had that multiple times so then until surgery. And uh, did you need to miss school for some of the chemo? So cycles? luckily the first part was during the summer. So that was nice. Oh. And then luck, thankfully my counselor in Waukee was super understanding and I was able to do online school. They set me up with an online school. I was able to take the same classes. So I didn't fall behind, which was really nice. And I got to go to the first day of school. I went to one class, which is really cool just to be back with my friends and my teachers even though I wasn't there the whole day. And that would have been the first day of your junior yeah. year. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, I went to one class that year. That was the only class I went to, but it was really cool to be back with everyone. And so it's like somewhat of a normal life. So what was the worst part of chemo? Just the toll that it took on my body. I was bedridden for hours and hours. And the first time I was throwing up all day, all night. And then just the physical toll it took. I was tired. I just wanted to sleep all day. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't have any motivation to do anything. Lost all your hair. Lost all my hair. So, I, so, what were you going to say? No, go ahead. I was going to say, <laughs> if you looked in the slides, I had blonde hair at one point at the start. So before I, when I, when I knew <laughs> wait, I was, wait, 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 naturally blonde. No, you it's had, on the okay. cover slide. George, so it was yeah. a fashion state. <laughs> yes. Okay. So now <laughs> on the first slide, you can see that I made the executive I decision see. to the, dye my hair blonde that I knew I was going to lose it. <laughs> okay so that was really fun i really enjoyed that and it was something cool that i knew it was coming out but i knew i could experiment with it a little bit and so then when it started coming out did you shave it did you yeah i cut it right away and did you do it yourself or did you have a professional we had someone else do it because it was it was really Bro. it actually it really hurt to get it shaved my i was so sensitive and my hair was so sensitive that it was like i was almost brought to tears by how much it hurt when she brought the clippers in my head but I think I pulled it off well. Okay. And what did you, what was your first thought when you looked in the mirror? It was very different because it was super patchy still. So it was, it wasn't like perfectly bald, like throughout the whole thing, but it was like, whoa, because I'd always had long hair my whole life and I not having any was something else. And then later down the road, I didn't have like my eyebrows, didn't have any eyebrows, didn't have any eyelashes. So just progressively got less and less. Um, and dad, what was the worst part of chemo for for you? And you know, it's it's interesting because the worst part for me was I think the worst part for Steven, and I'll say it a little differently because as an under eighteen individual, I don't know who, but the the hospital requires them to stay in hospital for X period of time after ingestion of the methotrexate in order to get it out of your system. And you know better than I, the numbers we had to wait, we would literally have to sit there after the methotrexate 13 hours, we're in there for 36, 50 hours of time waiting for the numbers. Now, I believe if he's 18, he can walk out immediately after the methotrexate and go, and he's months away from his 18th birthday and we're stuck. And I will say, you know, to me, I feel like that brought on the depression that brought on the lack of e energy, no exercise. He's laying in a bed for 36 hours at a time when I think he should be running laps. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. felt like that was just working against us. Mm -hmm. And it worked. His mindset was not in a good place because we would sit there for hours and we would stay up all night waiting for the numbers, begging them to take another lab, you know, like get us out of here. We just want to go home. And it became this funny kind of game, a contest. Uh, it felt like there was always a lawyer in the room somewhere that we couldn't see or touch, but there was somebody else guiding this besides common sense. And, and we would literally try to say that, you know, my son's really depressed here. We're all depressed. Poor Sherry's laying on this kind of uncomfortable bed couch thing, you know, for three nights. Uh, could we go home? So, so I would say that was so the it was 10 cycles of chemo and, and, and I'm kind of, um, uh, inferring that at this point you you were just we just need to get this through and in this the logistics of it what about the the fear of is it gonna work is my mm. life no. in danger a, a, 
how long did that shock last before you just got into the routine of the the, the treatment? I mean, yeah, that never went away. Even okay. the whole time I had it on my mind, like, is this going to work? Is this not uh-huh. going to work? I mean, I think everyone, like, everyone who is diagnosed Googles the numbers, the survival rate, the if it works, if it doesn't. And, I, of course, I did that when I found out. And that always stuck with me. It still sticks with me now and being in remission. And that always kind of hung over me. But I was always, and with my parents, who always had the mindset that it was going to work. And that really, we knew, really knew it was going to work when I got the tumor removed. And it was 99% removed. So we definitely knew that it was working. Mm-hmm. But that beginning before you got the first chemo, so you did your docs to talk to you what the plan was going to be, but you kind of wanted to do your own research and see what the yeah what the World Wide mm-hmm. Web said about yeah. your prognosis. Tr- yeah. So when you pressed enter that 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 night or day, yeah, what, it was scary because it was like I'm pretty sure it's like a um, it's a sixty forty percent. So it's like I didn't want to be on the wrong side of that, and I knew that with like. I mean, I really had no control over it, but all I had to do was just believe in it and just believe that the doctors and the surgeons knew what they were talking about and that we were able to get through it. And uh, during the, the chemo phase, how was um, how was your your support, your friends? First of all, your friends. Yeah, that was the biggest part of it. I think uh-huh. my friends and family, they would come almost every single day. I'd have someone visiting me and we'd have pizza parties on the weekends. We'd watch the sports games and especially when I went home on my breaks or over the weekends, I would always go and hang out with friends and they'd always take me to go out to eat. And I had the best support group I feel that I could have had. I had people that I've never even met come into my life and now that we're best friends. And I really think I couldn't have done it without that group. So what would be one of the most surprising things that happened during chemo in terms of your interaction with with friends. Yeah. So I think probably one of the biggest things is I had a tennis tournament in my name set up by two people I've never even met in the tennis community. And they set up a tournament to raise money for uh, multiple organizations. And it was in my name and it was super cool because I was able to go actually and watch the tournament and kids were playing with my team Steven shirt on. And that was probably one of the coolest experiences I've ever had was seeing people out playing tennis, which I couldn't be doing at the time, but I could watch them play sporting me. And it was really cool. And dad, what, what about uh, family and friends and um, surprising things that happened from your perspective as a parent? Yeah, a lot of them. And, and like Stephen said, people that you never expected, people, complete strangers entered our lives, you know, that we would have never expected to have met and to have contributed to the journey uh, was one of the most surprising Um the uh you know right from the get-go family was involved i flew my father out you know was willing and able to come out and come through the diagnosis conversations with us he came out for the biopsy you know came out to iowa city he's a long-term pharma guy uh, grew up in clinical research so he had a background he's he's advocated for his mom and dad as they went through their end of life so he he taught me how to advocate uh, and helped us advocate through this process. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe too much. You can hear my, my little bit of things. Uh, yeah, a little rough edges still in that. It's but, your uh, son. It's your son, yeah. and yeah. and you have to advocate. Even if you have to ruffle a few feathers, you know. And, and that's that's what he showed me right from day one, um, which was very helpful. Uh, but he was always there. They were my parents were always there. Our parents were always there throughout this entire journey. Um, and and friends and family. Stephen had an opportunity where. Uh, a professional tennis player in Australia, Nick Kyrgios, hears about Stephen's story through a couple of connections. Next thing you know, Kyrgios's tennis racket shows up on our front door after he smashed it through a temper tantrum on the court, <laughs> signed it, and mailed it to Stephen. Wait, you and got posted a smashed it. tennis racket? Okay, <laughs> probably more famous that way. Yeah. Okay. That kind of stuff happened, okay. and it just blows us away. Can't, uh, you know, thank you enough for the introduction to Fran McCaffrey. It's Fran, uh, Luca, and Patrick showed up in our hospital room the day after surgery. Blow us away, you know, and uh, I know you had something to do with that. Thank you very much. But uh, you and I didn't even know each other at the time, which made this even more amazing. Yeah, it's uh, people want to help. Yeah, People want to help. And... um, some people, um, my experience with uh, taking care of many patients is that some, sometimes patient, uh, uh, friends or families sort of 
become distant because they don't know what to say and they're afraid they're going to say something wrong. Did oh. you experience that at all? Where any of your friends like yeah, were nervous definitely. around you and yeah. didn't know what to say? And definitely, when I told a lot avoided. of people, it was definitely like they didn't know what to say or like they just kind of like shied away from it. And like a lot of people I know were like too afraid to come to the hospital and visit because they didn't know like what was going to happen or how sick I really was. But then a lot of still a lot of people were upfront with me about it. And I was glad about that because I, could t I needed people to talk to about it. I needed people to go through the journey with me because I couldn't do it alone. And I was really thankful for those people who understood what I was going through and especially didn't treat me differently because I had cancer. I didn't want to be treated differently. I still wanted to be able to hang out with people and go and do everything that a junior in high school would do. So you obviously have a very supportive family. I've met mom and dad, Rob and Sherry. And um, um, during the chemo part, <clears throat> did you uh, were you ever offered or did you have your own professional counselor? Kind of. I have um, we have I had a mentor who also had cancer. He's older, he's a little bit older than me. And before everything happened, I met with him. I met with him and we talked about just what it was and what to expect and well, everything that would happen to me because he didn't have the same type of cancer that I did, but he was able to kind of introduce me to ideas and mindsets to have. And knowing to, that I had him, ugh, knowing that I had him to go through it with, he came to my first chemo session and kind of gave us the ins and outs of the hospital and like tips for everything. And it was really nice to have him on my side. Okay. And what about us, uh, like school counselor or pa pastor or any other professional counselor no your, we tried team? to like a counselor through the hospital it didn't really work i okay. didn't i mean it was a good attempt but it just didn't really work i didn't really mesh with them well i just really thought that my counselor was were in my parents and my friends and i think mm -hmm. that really worked best mm -hmm. yeah having a, a good relationship with your folks is yeah really really strong and important uh, at this time well let's go next to uh the next phase of your treatment which was the surgery so i think uh, we've got the, the photograph uh, of the um, x-ray after surgery. So that's after surgery, right? On the right, yeah. And, and maybe while that's up, uh, tell us a little bit about w w the surgery, the day of surgery. What were you thinking when you went under anesthesia? Um, how long was the surgery? Yeah. What was your, what's the first memory you have when you came out of the surgery? Yeah, so I think the really cool place to start is the day before I had a friend up in college up there. We actually went skateboarding, we just skateboarded around and talked. And I was like, this is the last time I'd be able to do this. And I thought that was really cool. I still have a picture of that, just me riding around on a skateboard. That was super cool. And then that morning, my family and I walked around Kinnick, something that I wasn't gonna be able to do for a while. So that was cool. You saw the selfie of us in the first slide. That was at Kinnick that morning. And then just up until surgery it was a blur. I had too many doctors to count. I had to get an epidural on my back. That was something I'd never done before. Um, and then the first thing I remember waking up, I don't remember it, but I have a video and it's a video of me very on a lot of pain medicine, taking a video of all the cords that were connected to me in the bed at four in the morning. And I remember being told, I think it was almost a six hour surgery. And that whole week, honestly, was a blur to me. I was on so many medications and was in too much pain to even remember it. But I do remember the McCaffrey's coming. I do remember a little bit of getting to experience the wave, which was a super surreal moment. But overall, that whole week was just a blur. It was there, <clears throat> it was pretty certain that you were going to be able to have surgery and keep your leg, correct? Yeah. That was definitely, was there, ever there was always when... an option. That was their other option was to amputate my leg. And that was definitely an option that we discussed. But all in all, it was more important to keep the leg when we could just go with a replacement. Yeah. So it wasn't like you woke up and the first thing is like, oh, I do still have a leg. No, but oh, okay. I do remember waking up and just seeing the huge bag of blood and off to the side that was with the tubes in my leg. And that was something that really freaked me out because I couldn't I couldn't see under all the bandages. I didn't know what was under there, what wasn't. So how long <clears throat> how long were you an in inpatient after the surgery? <clears throat> so we were there, we were there, I think 10 days. So okay. it was it was a pretty lengthy time, but the University of Iowa made it super welcoming and it was really good. I was able to eat a lot of good food and everything. It was super helpful and accommodating to all of us. So and um at that point you were nine 
17. I was still no, 17. No, no, 17. That was in September. 17. So you were in the children's hospital. Mm -hmm. I was instead. It was uh -huh. awesome. It was really cool. Like I said, I got to experience the wave. <laughs> in the game that weekend and that was i have videos out of my phone that, that was something that i'll never forget so what was the date of your surgery uh the 24th of september okay so you're in the middle of football season mm -hmm. yep <clears throat> okay so it was football season was in full swing it was the i think we had the third game of the year so okay. um then i'm sure when we're next step was rehab yeah and when do you get to start rehab and how how much did you, have, uh, did you have to baby it? And at what point did you get to start to do some rehab? Yeah, so it was definitely, I was, so they actually ended up breaking my leg in surgery. So I had to stay for almost two months, no weight bearing on that, which usually when they do the surgery, you don't have to do that. You can bear weight right away. So that pushed me back two months of not doing really anything. And then I was able to go back to my physical therapist. We were able to start bending my knee slowly. I was still in a straight leg brace, still wrapped up. I was in a straight leg brace, but I was able to bend it a degree or two every let's, week. Let's go to some of the pictures. Most of your rehab back here in Des Moines? Yeah, almost all of it was at my local physical therapy clinic. And yeah, it was. So here we are. This is, uh, there's the wave there's the in the hospital. middle, right? Yep, there's the McCaffrey's and the on the McCaffrey's left. visiting. That's during the wave. And then we have some enemies on the right, but it was still pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I would have Cy visit me, and that was pretty cool. <laughs> They let Cy into this. That was, in, that, was at, that was in Des Moines. Oh, okay. I know. Yeah, I don't think they let him in. No. That. No. That was in Des Moines. That was still pretty cool, though. Okay. And uh, let's go to the next slide. And uh, that was my um, kind of my. That was <laughs> that's a, one of the lower my, points on the journey. Of pictures. That was actually a couple of days after surgery at the university. And that was kind of. You get to go outside. And my mental state in a picture. <clears throat> okay. Next slide. Oh no, the PT's next one. Yeah. Okay, we'll go there. We'll come back there to that go. one. Here yeah. we go. There. So here's yeah. Here's the physical therapy. Kind of that third picture was me being able to move my knee. It was even, but it was that was probably a couple months into it. It was still like I said, a degree or two every single day. Like it was the slowest process I've ever had. Seeing, especially seeing all my friends out playing basketball, playing tennis, running around, and I was in a wheelchair and a walker still. But I mean, I was a lot of hard work and I couldn't have done it without my parents. My dad really pushed me a little bit farther than maybe we would have liked sometimes, but in the end, it really helped me be where I'm at today. Yeah, so so talk about that, Rob, a bit. I mean, there are um, two approaches. I mean, there's many approaches, but I mean, one is, um, you know, let's uh, give you a hug and some empathy. And the other is, how about a can I? suck it up and a kick in the butt yeah. and so, you know uh, the, uh rehab's a little bit of both and so how how did you approach that uh being a kind of his steven's coach maybe a bit in in the rehab and getting him back to function yeah i mean i i probably erred on the side of a uh, fitness coach more than anything else uh a little open a can of suck it up is how I grew up. Uh, so I'm sure that's just natural for you to hear from me anyway. But uh, I think one, I led by example. I wasn't sitting on the couch and asking him to do something I wasn't about to do. I think that uh, I've always believed that your muscular skeleton holds up your uh, bones for that matter. And I believe you should have your mus muscles hold up your body. And I told him that from, from a young age. Um, and I know that, you know, the more, the stronger you are, the, the better your bones will be, or your replacement bones in this case will be. Uh, so I strongly encourage them to get into, you know, squatting and deadlifts and not to mention upper body work. Uh, we bought a gym, uh, for the home right away, a big, you know, inspire rack that we put up. Uh, so we got into it and I, you know, I, he, he, we talked about amputation, but I was literally Googling like different blades to put on, like what advantage he was going to get, you know, and how we were going to strap it onto a snowboard. And I was kind of having fun with it at your expense. Um, but, uh, but we had to, cause we, we, I was, I was, I needed a path back to mm -hmm. who we were before mm -hmm. too. And, and I knew that fitness and I knew that, you know, if it, so before you got to stand on your leg and move your leg were you allowed to do upper body yeah i could do i uh -huh. and i would i would even if i was sitting down i would still be moving my upper body still uh -huh. be able to 
lifts with my upper body. It was just a slow process. Whether I was going to be on crutches in the basement or using my walker, I was still able to work out as much as I could my upper body. Do you remember the day you, you, you took the first step without crutches? I do. It was pretty cool. I remember it was in physical therapy. I started with one crutch and then uh, I just was like, I don't need this anymore. And I was able to take a couple steps down my crutch. And that was a super surreal moment because it was still eight or nine months after surgery. So it, it was a long time yeah. coming, but I could tell that all my work would have, was really paying off. And that was just the first step in a long road. So before that, that uh, first step, how many times did you fall down? A lot. It was a lot of a lot a lot of being held and up. How about the first time you fell down? Like when you weren't in physical therapy, you were like in school or at home. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'd be at home and I'd stumble over my walker. Like it's like, oh my god, yeah. he broke it. You broke your wrist, remember? Oh. That was way after that. Oh well, wow. but yeah, I did break my wrist. I oh. tripped and fell. I still wasn't as fast as I could. That wasn't while I had my brace or anything, but okay. I did trip and fall all over my my leg that wasn't really keeping up with me and I broke my wrist, but still when I had everything, I'd, I took my fair share of falls or I learned to have to slide down the stairs and like um, yes. not use it as a slide, not walk down the steps. So I really played it safe after the first few. Um, when, how long did it take before you felt like you were in your new normal? I uh, probably two years, okay. I would think two years back when, I think back when I really started playing tennis again, being able to compete, that's when I felt like I'm back to where I am and where I, I think I could be. I, I always think I can get better. I'm, I'm never satisfied with where I'm at, but I really think when I was able to keep up with some of my buddies playing tennis, I really thought that that's when I was back. So talk a bit about the first time back on a tennis court after the surgery. Yeah. So the first time I was back, it was at a tennis tournament that I was just watching with some friends and I just wanted to go out and hit. And I, that was literally just me standing there on my own with a racket. But that was still something super cool for me, just being able to hold a racket again and hit, even if I wasn't moving. And then I graduated into going back to practices and, and then that just came back and started playing the tennis season. Yeah. So I think we have a, a, a picture of so this would have been then your senior year yeah. mm -hmm. and here in Iowa, tennis is a spring sport. It is. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's a spring, uh, just probably a couple months before you're graduating or maybe yeah. a month before. So there it is. Yeah. So I, we ended up winning the state championship my senior year. I was playing singles and doubles much to the, my parents did not, my mom did not like it that much. He loved it. But, yeah, uh, she didn't. She didn't like it too much, but I couldn't give it up. My senior year, I knew that I missed the first day of practice because she didn't really want me to play. And I told my coach, "I'm not sitting out anymore." So then I started working my way back in, and then I just kept playing more and more. So, um, with your surgeon, was it uh, "Don't ask, don't tell," or <laughs> did you get permission? Eh, it was kind of like a, you know your limits. I don't think I don't think he liked it too much as any surgeon would who replaces a knee, but. I knew I don't I think he knew that with my work ethic and who he, he knew who I was I wasn't gonna stop mm -hmm. and I wasn't gonna let it stop me because I, I think that he understood that I'm still a 18 year old kid living my high school life and I don't think he really wanted to ruin that and take that away from me. So uh, you got to play on the championship team. We did, yeah. Yeah. It was pretty. It was pretty wow. awesome. We, I, me and my um, best friend clinched it for us. So that was. I don't think there could have been a better way to really wow. end it. Yeah, so it was a super surreal moment for everyone. I mean, we played with um, our jerseys that were customized to have my initials with the cancer symbol right there. And I think winning in those jerseys and me being on that court was something that I'll never forget. Um, so mom and dad, or dad, what, what, what was your, th as you're watching your son play at the state <laughs> tournament? I mean, just incredible pride, yeah. you know, and and seeing the team support was just incredible. The moms and dads all on the sideline, just knowing. So he's not giving himself enough credit. So the team did. They dedicated the, the entire season to Steven, not expecting him to play. And Steven even went out there first time saying, I'm just going to be the team manager, you know, help him with throw some towels. I'll spar with him a little bit. And it was more like the sparring became him being more and more competitive. And then he was able to you know, lateral and forward and back. And, and then a couple of the kids would always tease you because they knew you couldn't get to some balls and they'd hit them back there yeah. and make you run. But Steven came home and that's why I had a quote up there. He came home one day and he said to his mom and dad, he said, I think I can play. 
you know, and of course I'm like, yes. <laughs> and Sherry's like, maybe. <laughs> Um, and then, but the team kind of self-nominated Steven to go out there too. And it was like this rally of support for him to go play. And he ended up picking up a doubles, uh, one and two doubles you played and number three, four singles from time to time. And, and they knew where to put you against which teams and the, t the whole team just rallied. And I think that is why this, this group won the state tournament. Right. So the whole ripple effect is yeah. because everyone, uh, just fed on this, uh, positive Purpose. energy. Yeah. 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 Um, so now we are two years out mm -hmm. and yeah. you've had every test turn out just uh, great and mm -hmm. you're in remission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How often do you go back for imaging? So now it's every six months to a year. I meet with uh, my surgeon every six months and then I go back to the clinic to get scans about every six months to a year now. So what's it like uh, the the day you get the scans? Oh, it's super. How, how yeah. long does it take to get the results? Um, well, I mean, leading up to it, super nerve wracking. I kind of go into my own little zone, my own little world that week leading up to it because it's like it's probably like the biggest day of my life. I mean, like who knows what I'm going to hear? I oh, I'm still freaked out about going to the hospital because I never know what to expect. But they're usually really quick about it. It's usually the same day we hear about it. When I get my blood work done, we hear about it when we're there. And then, I mean, the doctor's always up front about it. It's always been good news. So, I mean, I'm going to keep going with that. Okay. Um, and, Dad, what's your, uh, the day of the scan, the follow-up scans? Can't focus, dizzy, mm -hmm. depressed, scared, mm -hmm. every emotion. When, when does that start? A week before, two weeks before? Uh, uh, for me, it's day of. Okay. I know for Sherry, it's probably weeks before. Mm -hmm. So, I would say we... we we're different about how we approach it. And maybe that's because I'm, I lock myself away at work for 10 hours, you know, that week a day and kind of can compartmentalize different things. Um, but it weighs heavy on all and always will. Um, what would you say would be some things that we in the medical co profession could do better for, uh, young men, uh, adolescent, I mean, uh, teenager, 17 year old going through this, what, what were, were opportunities for improvement? On I think our just like, we, like offering more opportunities kind of, you have to, like where I was, the hospital was designed for like four year olds and I'm a big kid. I never fit in any one. I never fit in a bed in my whole time in any of the hospitals. I was, I'm six foot two and I don't fit. And I know, I know of, someone one of my friend's brothers who's six nine i couldn't imagine him fitting in a hospital bed and i mean it's kind of just like modernizing it and kind of approaching it as a teenager would you got to have the opportunities for the kids you got to have now like xboxes and playstations or have things to do for the kids not just playing with like they like having a set of trains like they're not going to play with that they're going to want to play video games or like watch sports or something and kind of where i was um they had like the smallest tvs and it's like no one wants to like i didn't want to have friends over to watch sports on a tiny tv it's kind of just like catering towards the needs of the growing interests of these older kids and how about your uh your friends and, and school anything opportunities I, for improvement there i think i mean at least for through Waukee, they did an amazing job kind of helping me and keeping me on track because that was a huge worry of mine was I was going to fall behind a year and be able to have to graduate a year later. But they did an amazing job sending me up with an online school and I had teachers who were helping me still. And I think they did a great job. I don't think they could have done anything better. And Rob, what about you? What, uh, what would be some observations you would have maybe about the, the whole medical aspect of the treatment for Steven? Um, you know, we, we were lucky. We had a great journey along the way and the people we met, everyone was just better than the next or the last for us. Uh, information is the key. So anywhere and anytime you can get information. Uh, I know Sherry found a great resource right out of the gate in a uh, forum called Momcology. It allows you to go from a global perspective all the way down to local Des Moines folks and have conversations and learn. And you can join different groups of, you know, teens with osteosarcoma. So very specific things. Um, I found you and, and Above and Beyond Cancer, and that allowed me to start uh, exercising as I used to do rides with Steven. I now do them with the Above and Beyond crew on Tuesday nights. It's, you know, fulfilling that void for me. Um, you know, the healthcare system, I think, again, I think it's 
where this, this treatment Stephen got is the same exact treatment you would have gotten in 1972, whether you're 54 or 17 years old. It's the same methotrexate, doxorubicin, and cisplatin. Um, I was hoping for a little bit more modern uh, uh, procedures. I don't know. I didn't hear the word CRISPR come up at all in my two-year journey, um, which I've been reading about for the past five years. I had higher hopes, I guess, for that technology or even some alternatives down that path. Um, but it wasn't even considered. It was just kind of like, well, this is the way we do it for 45 years and we're not deviating from this. And, mm. and he's not leaving until this number equals this. I don't care if it's that. And it was just very regimented for us where I felt like you have to take individuals into consideration. And, and, uh, I don't know, it got a little frustrating, I guess, from the, the standard map protocols that we had to adhere to at his age. Um, but again, I will say that that's the protocol that I was probably frustrated with. The folks that were guiding us through that protocol knew it, understood it, were empathetic about it, showed us where we could cut a corner if we could to, were willing to push the boundaries uh, for clinical research if they had to. Uh, so I do appreciate all the folks along that way, uh, including those that were there in the darkest, darkest hours, because it was important to be there. And how about uh, you and Sherry in terms of emotionally, psychologically during this time? Um, the entire journey? Yeah, looking back on it. Brought us together even stronger uh, than we ever were. And I think, you know, adversity will do that for folks. Um, we are stronger as a family than we ever have. We always, always were before. And I think that helped going into all this, you know, knowing that Okay, whatever comes at us, we got each other. So we knew that the day it, you know, was diagnosed and coming out of it, we knew, uh, you know, we've seen each other at our at our lowest points and we're there for each other. So we know we can only uh, go to higher places together from this point forward. So I think that helped brace the emotions um, and allows for humor to come in because you can tell it's a necessary coping mechanism for me. Um, and, and that happens only in a place of trust. So, Stephen, what, what have you learned on your cancer journey? I, I mean, I had to learn to grow up really quick. I was I knew that when I heard those words, I knew that I was no longer a 17 year old. I had to grow up really fast. I had to deal with things that no one should ever have to experience. And I think that really shaped me to who I am today. I'm I always say that it's one of the like, I think it's one of the best things that's happened to me. I've grown up so fast. I've totally changed a lot of my mindsets and it allows me to work a lot harder and push myself. And like I said, I'm never satisfied and I'm especially never satisfied anymore because I want to prove everyone wrong. I was told I was never going to play tennis again and I'm playing tennis. I wasn't supposed to snowboard and I'm snowboarding and I'm not supposed to play basketball. I'm playing basketball. So it's like I just want to keep making everyone proud and proving everyone wrong and kind of setting my own limits. Um. So you, you've uh, you've always been a strong person. You you kind of realize that you have strength that um, you can take on challenges. Um, what, what else have you learned in terms of maybe interactions with people, or your philosophy of life, or your you know glass half empty, glass half full? Yeah. Any changes? So, I mean, now I definitely look at it as like every day. I just take it one day at a time. I'm like, I got to make the best of this day because everything can change in a blink of an eye. So I just want to make the most out of every single day and accomplish everything that I can in that given day and then just move on to the next. So what's it like uh, being at the University of Iowa? Uh, I mean, the, the hospital is right there on campus. What, what do you think when you go by yeah. the hospital so, on your way to class? Um, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting because when I go to the rec to work out in the morning, I'm staring right at Stead and then that, that's pretty cool. And when I'm squatting on the squat rack on my metal knee that I got just down the block, it's pretty interesting to see it. But I think probably the coolest experience was this year. I got to wave to the hospital and actually have a video that I made of both sides of the wave, which not many people can say that they have. And doing that was a really cool experience, but being able to see that hospital, some days it's a really cool thing, but then some days when I'm not having the best day or my knee's hurting, I get a little nervous. I'm like, can I end up there again? So it, it has both sides of it. Well, I appreciate you being here and sharing your story. Are there days where you just like don't want to tell the story and you just want to be? Uh, For sure. I mean, it's definitely some days, I mean, Almost every day, or not almost every day, but often people will ask me. I've had 
two foot scar on my leg. So it obviously brings up conversation. And a lot of those times I'm like, Oh, another time. Like I'm, I want to say like I got attacked by a shark or something like that, but it's like, but it's like some days it's just like, uh, I just want to be treated like a normal Uh kid. Like I want to forget about, I don't want this scar Uh showing, but then other days I think it's a super cool opportunity. And I'm, I love sharing my story and I love doing things like this, be able to talk about it and spread awareness. So I do love sharing it, but then there's always, I think everyone has those days where they're just like, oh, I'm over it. I just want to forget about it for a day. So what's the stupidest question someone has asked you? Like, oh, I mean, when we're doing an interview like this, I, it might be, it might've happened today. You know? No, I, I've never gotten it. I've never really had a stupid question, but I think not in an interview, but I, I have been questioned. We mean my mom and I were questioned why I was in the handicap spot in the wheelchair. They did question, they did question that. So that was probably the one of the funniest things was this old lady at the mall asked me why we were in the handicap spot as I was in my wheelchair. That was something, but you're right. You just have to laugh through. I was it was and we laughed about it. We were like, what is this lady thinking? Like, why would you ask that? But you're not old enough to have a handicap. Yeah, and I still get I mean, and like when I was even using a walker or like driving on my own, I would park in the handicap spot to walk in. I still get weird looks or people what I'm people people don't know, but it was just probably that was probably one of the funniest moments. So um what are um has has your professional goals changed at all as a result of your cancer journey? For sure. So originally probably since be, even middle school, I wanted to be an anesthesiologist. I wanted to be, I wanted to be in the medical field. I took every single science class in high school in order to do that. I was going to college to be an anesthesiologist. Like that was my set goal. Then after that, I was like, can't say step foot in the hospital anymore. <laughs> can't even do it. I was like, no science, no medical. I'm done with it. Really? So then I switched over to business and hopefully going down the financial path now. So I, I really did want to be an anesthesiologist and people people really think that's odd switch. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. How did you choose anesthesiology? Did you ever know an anesthesiologist? Not really. I mean, we knew like, we knew some mutually that I'd talked to, but it was never like a, I just thought it was like the coolest thing ever. And cause I had a hernia removed and I think that was kind of what sparked it, but I just always thought it was the coolest thing ever. Okay. So your cancer journey, you didn't come through it being, I want to be a cancer doctor. No, yeah. and I, I know no people. Ways. I know people do. I know people want to even who aren't even in the medical like realm wanted to go into medical, but that was a complete opposite for me. I couldn't even. I I would love to, but I I just can't bring myself to even step foot in a hospital on my own anymore. So, what's the best thing about being a Hawkeye? Just the the culture. The culture of being in Iowa City can't be beat. Just like we were talking about earlier, the sports teams, the people there, the fact that my doctors are there, just the connections that I've made, the opportunities that are presented to me, it's something that can't be beat. Yeah. So Rob, where'd you go to college? LaSalle University in Philadelphia. Okay. And uh, so what do you think of your son going to Iowa? Did you ever hope he would go to LaSalle or? Not at all. No. Uh, No. Proud that he's a Hawkeye. Proud that we're Hawkeye supporters. You know, from day one, when we moved here in 2008, we were consumed by Hawkeye marketing. I'll just say like somehow we just ended up in the Hawkeye realm. And uh, so Stevens had his eye on uh, the university for 13, 14 years. And I'm super proud that he's there today. And Rob, how have you changed as a result of your family's journey with Stevens cancer? A lot of what Steven said, much more appreciation for every day and every hour and every person in our lives. I've taken nothing for granted ever since that diagnosis day where I clearly know that I took things for granted prior uh, to that day, June 14. Um, so for me, it's it's taking things w- much more in stride, uh, learning to take a deep breath and get to that uh, deeper, more inner thought. Uh, That usually comes from the heart, not the, you know, primitive brain. Um, And I've also stepped up my own personal fitness. I uh, I've 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 personally uh, committed to myself that I want to show Stephen that fitness is the way to go above and beyond cancer has helped me uh, keep up my fitness while going through some rough times. Uh, and I want to give all that back. And that's where uh, that's what I want to try to do. And I'm super proud of Stephen wanting to share his story because giving back is what exactly what we needed. Um, 
back in the day where we had some mentors come through. Uh, the more we can give back to those who are starting that journey will only make me more proud of us as a family. So that's that's really my focus right now and um, calmer, kind of cooler, <laughs> better heads are prevailing. Okay. Yeah. Have you, Stephen, have you had that opportunity to be a mentor for anyone? I have. I've talked. So actually, um, someone who went to my school previously, then moved away, was actually diagnosed with the Ewing sarcoma. And I was able to really help him and coach him through everything because it was all new to him. And I remember that exact feeling. And I was able to get in contact with him. And kind of we just texted. Um, if he ever had a question, he reaches out to me. He still does. And it's something that, I mean, I always want to do. And I'm always open to helping other people going through the same journey. Yeah. Great. Well, let's open it up some some questions. We've got a large studio, live studio audience. Were there any photographs that we didn't touch on that we need? Okay, no, we'll, we'll do some of the, some questions here. Poon, do you have a question? No. Here we go. We got Jerry does. Jerry does. Yeah. Um, above and Beyond Cancer Book Group uh, read a book a while ago about. It's called Between Two Kingdoms. And the Can you say that author, again, the name of the book? Between Two Kingdoms. Between Two Kingdoms, yes. And the author went through a long a chemo and treatment. And then about the second half of the book is about what happened after that. And her basic experience was it was worse. It was harder afterwards than when she was going through the treatment. I, I wondered if you had any feelings like that. I don't think it was necessarily harder. It was definitely more of a relief to be done with it, but I don't, I wouldn't say I def, definitely wouldn't say it was harder. It was more, it was more being focused on the rehab aspect and I was, I was definitely kept busy. So I don't, I definitely don't think it was harder. No. Yes. Uh, my question is concerning is that have you seen any advantages, the fact that you've had cancer versus if you did not have the cancer, uh, you know, not just the handicap sticker or anything like that, but, you know, perhaps, you know, scholarships or, or uh, opportunities that you had just because you had that cancer. Yeah, so definitely. I mean, the opportunities that have been presented and the people that I've met was definitely something that I would never have gotten without having cancer. And also, speaking of the scholarships, it was something great to write about. I mean, not a lot of people can write about that for essays. And a lot of essays that I've had to write have had to deal with, like overcoming a challenge or overcoming adversity in life. And that's a great thing to write about. And then also the university and the hospital do offer scholarships for cancer survivors. So that was also some a good advantage that was brought to my attention as well. Hi, Stephen. It sounds like you had quite a journey and you learned a lot and you had grown up. And it's such an inspirational story that you told us tonight. So I'm going to go off on a little tangent here. I'm I'm the enemy. I'm a cyclone. Um, so, <laughs> and, and we didn't get a good NCAA seed. Or we're not going to be going anywhere. But what do you think about the Hawkeyes and how far they're going to go? Oh, <laughs> prediction, I, prediction. I think I think they have a chance to make it. I I hope to that they win it. But I well, think well, you you think they're going to get by the Jackrabbits? <laughs> Well, you that the could most. be their that could be their second game. It could. I don't know. They gotta get if they make it past them. They gotta get through Kansas. Oh, so okay. that's something. But and then if they get through Kansas, it's Arizona. Yeah. So I don't know. It'll it'll definitely be tough. But I think I think they have a sweet sixteen appearance in wow. them for sure. All right. All right. Iowa State. I don't know if they'll get past LSU, but <laughs> we'll see. So so for those who, who weren't part. <laughs> I, I went to South Dakota State undergrad, so they, they are in the same bracket. And if they both win their first game, they will play each other. So mm -hmm. That'll be a challenging game to watch, not knowing who to root for. <laughs> Any other questions for Stephen or Rob? Yes, yeah, George. I got one, actually. So um, you've had an opportunity to meet elite-level athletes. Do you feel that athletes at that level have an extra – understanding and appreciation for injury illness and recovery for sure they definitely i mean they have the hardest training regimens on the planet and they definitely know the importance of recovery and the importance of taking care of your body so to hear from them and to kind of get advice from them really makes a huge difference because they have to perform at the highest level and i think i want i mean i obviously want to perform at the highest level as well so 
being able to hear that from them and take the advice from them really helped me on my journey. Excellent. Any last words of wisdom for our folks? I mean, just being able to share my story, I'd like to thank you for that. And it's just an awesome opportunity. I mean, I want everyone to know that they can do it, whatever they're going through, whatever it may be, if it's with cancer or with um, mental battles or physical battles, that anyone can do it. And they just have to be able to reach out and talk to someone because I was afraid to talk to someone at first, but talking to someone really changed my life. So that's what I wanted to say. Great. Well, thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Please come and join us again next week. If uh, you know someone who uh, would like to see this uh, video podcast, it's going to be on the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel tomorrow, and it will also be at the um, uh, Mercy Cancer Center website. So thanks again, and join us next week.